come and be with you. And I want you to go ahead and turn your Bibles, if you will, to Luke chapter 11 this morning. And thank you for the wonderful place to stay. And thank you for being my friend, preacher. I appreciate that very, very much. Um, my dad just went to, uh, home to be with the Lord August the 9th. And he was 92 years old. And I got to lead my daddy to Jesus when he was 87. And so I'm going to be telling you all about that in the message today and so thankful for that. And my brother just wrote this song recently. And uh, hey, will you bring me that green iPad right there, brother? I've learned the words of this song, but sometimes they just fall off my brain. As a matter of fact, in the first service, I couldn't even remember the first song I was supposed to sing. It just hurts my heart a little bit. But that's what happens when you start getting older. You know, things just don't work like they used to. It's like the rodeo rider said. He said, some parts just wake up sooner than others. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, I didn't want to mess this song up because it's a sweet song that my brother just wrote not long ago. And we've uh, recorded a new CD called The Best Is Yet To Come. Hallelujah. And uh, so those are out there on the table. Just a little commercial here for you. I'm still selling CDs. I don't know how long that's going to last. I've got flash drives for cars that don't have CD players. And there's a newsletter about the movie Brothers Twice out there on the table. So if you're interested, come by there. And like I told you the first time I came here, I don't need your money, but the people I owe, whew, they need it real bad. All right. So there we go. As I read of the glory of heaven, street of gold that now you walk upon gates of pearl and that heavenly city a perfect place prepared is now your own safely home in the arms of the father with the saints the lamb of god redeemed one day we'll meet there together Heaven's so much sweeter now to me and No pain, no death, and no darkness And no sorrow, no tears to be seen Face to face with our wonderful Savior Songs of praise with angels you now sing. Safely home in the arms of the Father. With the saints, the Lamb of God redeemed. One day we'll meet there together. Heaven's so much sweeter now to me. In our sorrow, we cherish your memory. In our hearts, you will always be near. All glory and praise to the Father for the life we all shared with you here. Safely home in the arms of the Father, with the saints, the Lamb of God redeemed. One day we'll meet there together. Heaven's so much sweeter now to me. Heaven's so much sweeter now to me. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Years ago, years ago, my, uh, I had a cousin who passed away. And her mom, my Aunt Patsy, came to me and said, Bruce, I want you to sing a song at my Linda's funeral. And I said, okay. I said, well, what do you want me to sing? She said, I want you to sing a song so everybody at that funeral will know that my daughter's in heaven. Even though she was not living right when she passed away, she was a child of God. And I want everybody to know that. Now, she's asking this to a lost person. And so I went and got a hymn book, and I started looking. I didn't know what I was looking for. I was lost as a goose flying backwards in a hailstorm at that time in my life. And, and so 
I couldn't find anything that I was looking for, and so I said, well, maybe I'll just try to write a song. And when I wrote this song, I could not get the words on the paper as fast as they were coming to my brain. And I believe to this day that God used me as a lost young man to write a song for one of his children. I believe that with all my heart. And I sang this at my dad's funeral or graveside. He didn't want to have a funeral service, so we did a graveside service for him. He was in Korea, and, you know, we had the Army come and do what they do there, and it was a, it was a sweet, sweet thing. But this is the song that I sang that day. Don't cry for me when my life's over. For my soul, he'll come to claim. Cause I know I'll live forever there within the Lord's domain. And if I'm there before this day is over, I'll be there before you know I'm gone. Don't shed for me your tears of sorrow, for Jesus take care of his own. Don't mourn for me when I have left here. Eternal peace there will be found. The choice was mine from the beginning. My Savior knows I'm heaven bound. And if I'm there before this day is over, I'll be there before you know I'm gone. Don't shed for me your tears of sorrow, for Jesus takes care of his own. Jesus takes care of his own. Well, the Lord uh, impressed upon my heart to bring you a message on prayer this morning. And I knew many of us, uh, usually when I hear a message on prayer, I want to be the first one to the altar because I don't never feel like I pray like I should or, or enough or fervent enough. But you know what? I know that my Father hears my prayers. And I am so grateful to be able to pray to my Father, knowing that He loves me and He wants to hear from me. And so if you have your Bibles open to Luke chapter 11, I'm going to start in verse 5, and I'll just read a few verses. And the Bible said, And he said unto them, Which, is you, which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves? For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Father God in heaven, Lord, I pray that you would use this message to encourage my brothers and sisters in Christ as they pray and as I pray. Father, I know that nothing's going to happen today unless you come down and meet with us. So I pray that you would fill me with your spirit, use me for your glory, and may your word go forth and accomplish that which you send it out to do. And Lord, I'm not a great preacher, but I serve a great God. And I need your help today because I realize without you I am nothing. Privately, I've prayed, and publicly, I acknowledge how much I need you this morning. And Lord, I pray for those who are praying for family members and loved ones and friends and co-workers that you would encourage them today not to give up. And Lord, I love you, and I always remember that if any good comes out of this, you deserve all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, I pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. You know, God wants to satisfy our prayers and give us the joy of being intercessors for others. This word, importunity, in this passage of Scripture means persistent. 
especially to the point of annoyance or intrusion. So why should we pray? Three reasons. Number one, God commands it. Number two, God delights in giving good gifts to those who ask. And number three, prayer changes things, and prayer changes you, and prayer changes me. There's a parable about persistence in prayer in uh, Luke chapter 18. So I want you to turn there for just a moment and read this parable that Jesus gave us. And the purpose for this parable is that we might not lose heart in prayer. The judge was unfair and unconcerned. God is fair and very concerned. And God didn't give this parable to say he was like the unjust judge, but God gave it so you would see that he's totally unlike this unjust judge. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. That's that importunity there, that continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjudged just saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17, Pray without ceasing. 1 Timothy 2, 1, I exhort therefore that first of all supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. The Bible says all men. That means that we should be praying for those in leadership. Whether we agree with them or not, whether we agree with their policies or not, God commands us to pray for all men. Our government, our president, his wife, and the vice president or her husband need our prayers. They need to be born again. They need to be saved. Nothing's going to change their life until that happens. 1 Timothy 2, 1, I exhort, therefore, again. Oh, I just read that. Never mind. James 5, 16. See, that's where my brain works right there. James 5, 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know, sometimes when I pray, sometimes I don't know if my prayers are that fervent or not. But whether I feel like they're fervent or not, I continue to pray because I believe that you're not going to get anything answered unless you pray. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we, are, we have an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Luke 19, 46, saying unto them, It is written, Jesus said, My house is the house of prayer. And you don't have to wait till you come to church to pray. You can pray anytime. As I drive down the road, I had a pretty long trip here yesterday, and, and I did a little praying. And, you know, you don't shut your eyes while you're driving and praying down the road. You don't do, don't do that, all right? Hebrews 7, 25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Do you realize that when you pray, Jesus takes your prayer through the throne room of God? Isn't that a wonderful thought? Because he's our go-between, our priest and king. And only Jesus could be priest and king at the same time. The word priest I found out in the Latin language is pontifex. You know what it means? Bridge builder. Jesus Christ built, built a bridge between man and God. 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ, Jesus. So what keeps us from praying? I want to give you three reasons that keeps us from praying. Number one reason, we stop asking because we faint. We give up because he doesn't answer on our timetable. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Isaiah chapter 40, 
uh, starting in verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And Proverbs 24, 10 says, If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Abraham Lincoln said, I have been driven many times upon my knees by an overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. So number one, we stop asking because we faint. Number two, we stop seeking because we fear. We quit because we're scared he won't answer. This lady in this parable, she didn't fear. She just kept asking. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. 1 John 4.18, per perfect love casteth out all fear. And then thirdly, we stop knocking because we lack faith. We stop believing he will answer. She had the faith to keep coming and keep coming and keep coming until she got what she wanted. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to keep praying. Hebrews 11:6. 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Matthew 21, 22, All things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. And John 14, 14, If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. But many times we pray not believing. Do you ever pray and really in your heart you say, I don't believe he's going to answer this. That's praying in unbelief. A man did that when his son was demon-possessed, and he came to Jesus in Mark chapter 9. And Jesus saith unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And Matthew 13, 58, And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now she didn't faint, she didn't fear, she had the faith to keep coming. In Jeremiah 33, 3, the Bible says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and shew thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. This is a beautiful verse, because number one, we have a command, call unto me. Number two, we have an assurance, I will answer thee. Number three, we have a promise, I will shew thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. In James chapter 4, in verses 2 and 3, it says, You have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. Never go to prayer and ask God for things that you know you really, it was not His will, but something that you just want for yourself in a selfish way. But every prayer which is asked according to God's will and in God's way, God will answer. In James 1, 5, the Bible says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and it shall be given him. John 16, 24, Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. In 1 John 3, 22, the Bible says, And whatsoever you ask, you receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears whatsoever we ask, we know that we have petitions that we desired of him. In John 15, 7, he says, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. So obviously, there are conditions in prayer. These marvelous promises assume that those who ask are abiding in his commandments, desiring his will, and having his priorities, thinking his thoughts, and are asking in faith and in his name. Do you realize it's a sin to stop praying? 1 Samuel 12, 23, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, some men count slackness, but is long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone to be saved, but not everybody's going to be saved because not everybody is going to pray the prayer of repentance and faith and trust Christ as their Savior. But we can share the gospel with them and give them as much as we can the Word of God, and then they're going to have to make a decision whether they trust God or whether they reject God, one or the other. 
Now, I want to share some illustrations of some answer prayer in my life. I hope these will be an encouragement to you, especially for those of you that have been praying for people for a long time. How many of you have been praying for somebody for a long, long time? Do you ever get discouraged? Do you ever wonder, God, are you ever going to save them? That's the way my brother was with me. He prayed for me for 21 years to be saved. And every time I would come home from Nashville, you know, I had the clothes that I wore, the dress, and the, I was just full of myself. And every time he would look at me, he'd say, God, aren't you ever going to do anything in Bruce's life? But you know what? God was doing something in my life. Sammy didn't know, but God did. And whoever you're praying for, God may be doing something in their life right this second, and you have no idea what it is. But you have to trust God with that. And so when I first got saved, you know when you first get saved, the first thing you want is for your family to be saved, right? You want your friends to be saved. And then you just want perfect strangers, the people you don't even know to be saved. Why? Because when you get saved, God puts in your heart something that gives you a desire for others. Now, I know that God has given me the gift of evangelism, and so I may be a little more fervent about that. But the Bible says... Whosoever is forgiven much, loveth much. And God has forgiven me for a whole lot. Forty-three years of a sinful life that God pulled me out of the pit and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. He hath put a new song in my mouth. Even praising to our God, many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord, the Bible says. So when I first got saved, I was living in Nashville, Tennessee. That's where I got saved. And then I drove to Aberdeen, North Carolina, nine hours home just so I could set my mom and daddy down and tell them what had happened to me because I wanted it to happen to them. Because I realized if my mom and dad don't get saved, if my little brother doesn't get saved, they're not going to spend uh, eternity in heaven with me. They're going to spend eternity in hell. And I was so burdened for my family. And I drove all the way down there. I set them down. I told them what happened to me. And I'll never forget that day as my dad looked at me and he said, well, that's great, Bruce. I'm, I'm happy for you. And my mom said, I don't understand. Bruce, you've worked so hard all your life to get this record deal. Ever since you were a little boy, you've always dreamed about this, and you've, you've gone, you've given up everything, and you're just going to quit? I said, Mama, I don't need a record deal anymore. I got a better deal. I got saved. Hallelujah. I don't need a bus with my name on it. I don't need number one hit records. I don't need recognition. I said, I have Christ, and I want you to have Christ. And I pleaded with him, and I did the best I could. But it was such a burden to me. And it's okay to have a burden, but you're not supposed to carry it to the point where only God can carry it. And what, what had happened is that I, I wanted my mom and dad and my little brother to be saved so bad, every time I got around them, I would just start crying. And, of course, they'd look at me and say, I don't know what happened to you, but every time you get around us, you'll start crying. What's that about? And they don't know what I'm thinking. But God helped me with that. My brother had a bus ministry back in the day, and one of his bus kids, the mom died, 45 years old, heart attack, gone. I was working with an electrician at that time, and he was a Christian man, and he knew sometimes that I would need to go do some ministry with my brother now and then, and Sammy called me that day, and he said, Bruce, is there any way you can meet me at the hospital so I can minister to this family? And, and I, I, call, I said, I'll, I'll call my boss. So I called David. I said, David, Sammy needs me at the hospital. And he said, Bruce, go. Go help your brother. When I got to the hospital, my brother was already there. There was a lot of family members, a lot of friends that were in there. I can't remember how many people, but my brother opened the Word of God. He shared some verses of Scripture, trying to give comfort to the family. And after he got finished, he prayed. And then he came by me, and he handed me his Bible. And he said, Brother Bruce, I'm going to go back here in this room where this woman's body is, and I'm going to weep with this man and his son. He said, please pray for me, brother. I said, okay, Sam. And so I took my brother's Bible, and I went and sat down, and I prayed. And after I got through praying, I was just sitting there, and I was looking. I went, wow, this is my brother's Bible. And I opened it to the first page. And what I did, you know what I saw there? On this day, and there was a date, I surrendered my brother Bruce to God. And it was circled. 
You have somebody you've been praying for for a long time, and it's just weighing you down, and you're sad because they're not saved yet? Give them to God. I went home that day, and I opened my Bible, and I said, on this date, I surrender my mom and my dad and my little brother to God. And I circled it. I'm telling you, there was a weight that was lifted off of me. I could go around my mom and dad, my little brother, and I didn't cry in front of them all the time. I could love on them, be with them, and have fun with them. Still had a burden for them, still praying. Then what happened was this. My mom was a church member, but she was lost. Anytime I would ask my mother about her salvation, she'd always say this, I got baptized when I was 16. It was like, I got baptized when I was 16, leave me alone. That's what it was. And then one day I was, I was taking a class. My brother was teaching a, a soul winning class because he wanted me to take it so I could take some people out door knocking. We had several people in our church that wanted to share their faith. They just didn't know how to do it. And so Sammy said, Bruce, if you'll take this class with me and you can take some people out, I can take some people out. And I said, all right, brother. And in the class, you had to take five people through this outline as part of your homework. And so I, when I thought about that, I said, well, I know the first one I'm going to do, I'm going to use is my little mama. So I went to my mom's house and I said, mom, I'm taking this class. Brother Sammy's teaching. And I said, I've got to take five people through this outline. Will you be my number one person? She said, sure, son, I'll do that. And so I set her down, and I asked her this question. I said, Mama, have you come to the place in your spiritual life where you know for sure you go to heaven, or would you say that's something you're working on? And she thought for a minute, and she said, Well, th yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'd, yeah, I'd go. I'm pretty sure I'd go. Sure, I'd go. I said, Okay. I said, Well, let me ask you this second question, Mama. I said, uh, Suppose you were to die right now and stand before God, and he was to ask you this question. Why should I let you into my heaven? What do you think you'd say to God, Mom? She said, well, I've lived a good life. I've raised three boys. I've been faithful to my husband, and I've never really done anything that bad. And I wrote her answers down. And then I took her through this gospel outline. I said, Mama, I want you to listen to me real closely. The first word I want to share with you is the word grace. Grace means that heaven is a free gift. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And because heaven is a free gift, it's not earned or deserved. Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. Then I share the word man with her. The Bible says that man is a sinner. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because man is a sinner, he cannot save himself. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. That's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then I shared with her the name God. God is merciful. He does not want to punish you but the, because the Bible says in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. But God is also just, therefore he must punish sin. Ezekiel 18, 20 says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And then there's Christ. Who is he? He's God the Son, the Son of God. In John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And simply put, God became a man like us so we can learn how to be a man like Him. That's who He is, but what did He do? He died on the cross for our sin, Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love or demonstrated or showed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then the last word I shared with her is the word faith. I said, well, first of all, I'll tell you what faith is not, mama. Faith is not just believing in God in your head. The devils do that. James 2.19 says, Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. It's a heart knowledge. Romans 10.9 and 10, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Saving faith is trusting Jesus Christ alone for eternal life. Amen. Jesus Christ alone we don't learn life because Jesus said in John chapter 3, ye must be born again. 
and you need to call on him and ask him to save you. Romans uh, 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So how do you call on God? God, if you're up there, save me. No, the Bible says you call on him in repentance and faith, Acts 20, 21. And repentance is very simple. The word repent means you change your mind. Number one, you change your mind about yourself. You're not good enough to get to heaven on your own, and you can't do good enough to get to heaven on your own. Secondly, you change your mind about your sin and realize your sin is against a holy and righteous God, against thee and thee only have I done this evil in thy sight. And then thirdly, you change your mind about your Savior and realize Jesus Christ is your only hope for heaven because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And after sharing all this with my mom, I said, Mama, when we started this, these were the answers you gave me that you would say to God if he said, why should I let you into my heaven? And I read her answers back to her. I've lived a good life. I've raised three boys. I've been faithful to my husband. I've never really done anything that bad. And before I could say another word, the tears started coming down her face. And I said, Mom, wouldn't you like to transfer your trust from yourself to Jesus Christ today and what he did for you? And she stood up and said, nope. And she was done. She didn't want to talk about it. And for a solid year, I prayed for my mama's soul and begged God. I said, God, I've done all I can do. And she's rejected. I said, only you can do what needs to be done. And a year later, she started having a couple of memory issues, and then she had a couple of minor car wrecks. We took her to the hospital, to the doctor. Got her, uh, they diagnosed her with Alzheimer's disease. I brought her back to the house that day, and I sat down in the backyard with her, and I said, Mama, do you understand what's going on in your mind? And she said, yeah, I got the big one. I don't want it, but I got it. I said, I'm so sorry, Mama. I said, Mama, a year ago, we sat at that picnic table, and I was taking a class, and I took you through the gospel and asked you some questions, and you answered some questions. I said, do you remember that, Mom? She said, I do remember that. I said, well, Mama, I don't want to go around the country telling people how to go to heaven and my little mama die and go to hell. Will you let me share the gospel with you again today? She said, okay, son. And I went through this again with her, shared the gospel, and I still had written in my Bible the answer she had told me a year ago. And I said, Mama, a year ago when I asked you what you'd say to God, this is what you said. I've lived a good life. I've raised three boys. I've been faithful to my husband. I never really did anything that bad. And before I could say another word, she said, that's not enough, is it, son? I said, no, Mama. I said, Mama, wouldn't you like to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today? She said, yes. Will you help me? I said, yes, Mama, I'll help you. And I told her, I said, we're going to pray a little sinner's prayer. I said, Mama, there's no power in these words. It's not magic words. It's not the prayer that saves you, but the one you're praying to, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that saves you. And I led her in a sinner's prayer, and she didn't say anything. And when I opened my eyes, she was staring right at me, tears streaming down her face. And she said, I ditto everything you just said. I said, okay, Mama. And I discipled her a little bit during the time until her mind got to where she couldn't even write on the paper. And I believe with all my heart I will see my mama in heaven one day. My dad called me on the phone when I was in Detroit in an airport trying to get home. He said, where are you, boy? And I want you to know something. My dad, my dad and I didn't talk for four years. We had a bad relationship. But God healed that relationship. And my daddy became my best friend. And we loved each other, and he knew I loved him. And I've been sharing the gospel with him, and I had a preacher friend of mine from Sanford, North Carolina, about 30 minutes away, had been coming to see my dad, bringing him food. My dad was in Korea, and my friend was in Vietnam, and so <clears throat> he was really clicking with my dad. I'll be honest with you, I thought my friend Steve Johnson was going to lead my daddy to Christ. That's what I thought. But when he called me that night in the airport, and he said, well, when you get home, he said, I want to talk to you. And I knew my daddy wanted to talk about the Lord. So when I hung the phone up, I just looked up and I said, God, my daddy wants to talk. Please get me home tonight, Father. And God answered my prayer. I did get home. 
I went by my dad's house the next day, and I said, Dad, sound like you want to talk about something. He went, I do. He said, but can we play a hand of cards first, just hang out a little bit? I said, sure, Dad. We played a couple of hands of rummy, hung out. And he said, hey, I need to go to the store. I'd like to go by your mama's grave. And I said, I'm your chauffeur, whatever you want me to do. I'm, I'm your man today, Daddy. We did all of that stuff and went by my mama's grave, and that's when my dad started opening up to me. He said, Bruce, when I was a young boy, he said, I was at a church. I really liked the preacher, and I went forward and prayed and got baptized. And he said, I'll just be honest with you, son. I don't understand it. And I said, well, let's talk about that, Dad. I started taking my dad through this outline and sharing the gospel with him, and he started saying things like this. Well, that makes sense. Well, I understand that. Amen. And finally, when we got to the end, I said, Dad, is this something you'd like to settle today? He said, I really, really would. Yeah. And I said, well, Dad, I can pray, and then you can talk to God, or I can help you. To he said, just help me, son, will you? And I led my dad in a simple sinner's prayer. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. When I came to the part where I said, will you please forgive me of my sins? My dad yelled out, many sins. I said, that's right, dad, many sins. And right there beside my mama's grave, my mama was 80 when she got saved and my dad was 87. And he just went home to be with the Lord August the 9th. He was 92 years old. And I thank God. I thank God for that. When I first came back from Nashville... I started working with an electrician there in North Carolina, and he put me on the truck with his brother, Robert. Now, his brother, Robert, if you met him, you would love him. I mean, his nickname was Smiley, if that tells you anything. And when this guy smiled, his eyes would just almost, almost shut. I told him, I said, Robert, I could blindfold you with dental floss, man. When you smile, I said, you're like a Chinaman. It's the funniest thing. I didn't realize it, but Robert used to come and hear me sing back when I was in rock and roll and country music. He knew the drinking, the drugging, the party Bruce. And so when, when David put me on the truck with Robert, I said, hey, Robert, as we drive down the road to these jobs and stuff, I said, could I share some things I'm learning in the Bible with you? He said, Bruce, anything you want to tell me about that book, I'll listen to you. I went, really? Because most of my friends I was trying to witness to, they didn't want anything to do with the Bible. But Robert said he has saw such a change in my life. He said, Bruce, I didn't know what had happened to you, but I wanted to know what happened to you. So every day I, I kept sharing scripture with him. I took him to hear a friend of mine preach one night, and Robert was under conviction. He was shaking. He was crying. I came this close to putting my arm around him and asking him if he wanted to go down front. But I felt like God just wanted me to leave him alone, so I did. And the next day we were driving down the road, and I said, I said Robert, God's dealing with you, isn't he, boy? He said, oh, man, he's been dealing with me. And I said, well, is there something keeping you from coming to Christ, buddy? He said, I can't think of anything. I said, okay. Two seconds later, tears started coming down his face, and he said, Bruce, I just lied to you. I know exactly why I'm not coming to Christ. And I said, well, you don't have to tell me. And he said, no, I want to tell you. My wife told me if I keep hanging out with you and going to church, reading this Bible, she's going to leave me. I said, oh, man. I said, well, Robert, would you rather lose your wife or lose your soul? He went, oh, man. That next Sunday, I don't even remember what our pre preacher preached about, but I had such a burden for Robert that I went to the altar specifically to pray for him. I was getting ready to get up, and one of the deacons put his hand on my shoulder and said, Bruce, Robert's coming down the aisle. Get back down there and thank God. And Robert came down the aisle, gave his heart to Christ, and got saved. He went back home that night. His wife was laying in the bed. He kneeled beside the bed, and he said, God, thank you for saving me. Please save my wife, save my children. Help me to be a good husband. Help me to be a good father. And we just cried out to God. His wife looked over at him and said, Robert, you have lost your mind. And he said, no, honey, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I want you to go with me. She said, oh, I did all that when I was a kid, but I don't act like that. That's crazy. In her testimony, she said what got to her was hearing her husband pray. And we had prayed all week long that she would come to church that Sunday, and she came. God answered our prayer. And when she walked in the door, I was in the choir, and when I saw her face, I went, God, I'm glad she's here but I don't think she's getting saved today. She looks pretty mad. 
I mean, she sat down, put her arm like, I mean, she was not a happy camper boy. But the preacher preached and they got ready to do the invitation. When the first note hit on the piano, she didn't walk down the aisle. She ran down the aisle. And she trusted Christ as her Savior, got gloriously saved. And we used to have these chick tracks back in the back of our church. And she got every one. She got every, you know, different one and got a pile of them. And the next day she went to work and she started laying them on her boss's desk. Walked in the door, started laying, filled his whole desk up with these chick tracks facing towards him. He's sitting there going, what in the world is this? And <laughs> she looked down and she went, you need to read every one of these. You're going to die and go to hell. See you later. <laughs> I mean, just became soul winner. Robert got saved. His wife got, wife got saved. His children got saved. And then his mama got saved. And then Robert told me, he said, Bruce, he said, I've been praying for my dad to get saved. He said, but he's a military guy. I've never seen my dad shed a tear as long as I've lived. I just can't see him crying out to God. And I said, well, Robert, God is bigger than your daddy. And we partnered in prayer and fervently prayed for his dad. I wasn't there when it happened, but Robert and his wife were sitting in the pew. His dad and his mom were sitting behind him, and Robert said, Bruce, I was so deep in prayer. I didn't go to the altar to pray for my dad, but right there in my seat, I said, God, you've got to save my dad. He's dying because his dad found out he had stage four cancer and had less than two years to live. And Robert said he was just fervently deep in prayer and his wife punched him in the ribs and he, he'd ignored her. She punched him again. He went, what? She said, look up. When he looked up, his dad was standing, holding on to the pew and crying so hard he couldn't move. And Robert got up and put his arm around his daddy, walked down to an altar just like this. And Robert's daddy got saved by the grace of God. You've been praying for somebody for a long time? God wants to save them more than you want them to be saved. Don't give up. Just keep on praying. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? With every head bowed and every eye closed. You raised your hand. And you said there's somebody you've been praying for for a long time. But you may be here today and somebody's been praying for you. You know, you say, Brother Bruce, will you pray for me? Because if I died right this second, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. Would you pray for me? Is there anybody like that I could pray for? God bless you. Anybody else? Bruce, pray for me because I'm not sure if I died right this second, I'd go to heaven. I sure don't want to go to hell. Pray for me. I'm looking up top. I don't want to miss you. If you just raise your hand, I'll pray for you and we'll move on. I won't come to you. I won't embarrass you. Bruce, pray for me because I'm just not sure. Father God in heaven, you've seen the hand that was raised and if there was another hand raised that I didn't see, you saw it. And you see the heart behind the hand. So I pray that they would come forward and let us open the Bible today and show them how they can know heaven's their home. Don't let them leave here lost today, please, God. Lord, many hands were raised. People praying for loved ones, family members, friends, co-workers. And Lord, we know that you love them and you died for them and you want them to be saved. So help us to do our part so you can do your part. Help us not to give up on those we love to keep on praying. Would you stand with your head bowed and your eyes closed? If there's somebody you've been praying for for a while, you might want to come to the altar and pray for them today. If God spoke to your heart, you come speak to him. Someone has a daddy and they love their daddy so. Time is steady passing. Daddy's getting old. Daddy, won't you listen? For the time is running out. It could be this very hour. Daddy, won't you listen now? Are you someone, someone's been praying for? Someone loves you enough to take the time to fall upon their knees, praying, Father, won't you please? Find a way before too late for my daddy to believe. You may have a brother, and only God can know the hours you spent praying for the brother you love so. You may be that brother, 
thinking time is on your side your soul will be required of you who knows this very night you may have a daughter or a son that you love so and they both have long forgotten the faith their mother sold and you may be that son or daughter and you're wandering far away Time has come to now return, and now before too late. Are you someone, someone's been praying for? Someone loves you enough to take the time to fall upon their knees, praying, Father, won't you please find a way before too late for my family to believe? Won't you find a way before too late for that someone to believe? Are you someone, someone's been praying for? Someone loves you enough to take the time To fall upon their knees Praying, Father, won't you please Find a way before too late For that someone to believe Won't you find a way before too late For that someone to believe Have a seat, would you?